Welcome to the 3030 Health Podcast. The following discussion is for education and entertainment. It is not intended to diagnose or treat disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first discussing it with your doctor. Here is your host, Dr. Ruiz. Hello, everyone. Super excited about my guest today. My guest today is Alison Vojtovich. Alison is the CEO of Flaps to Fitness, a company she founded just before graduating from the University of Texas at Austin. Allison has BS in kinesiology, is personal training certified, and has nutrition coaching certifications through Precision Nutrition. She also has a BA in theater and dance. So in addition to acting and performing stand-up comedy around Austin, her company offers online fitness and nutrition coaching, as well as social media management and content curation for the brands in the industry. Let me remind you, AHS, the Ancestral Health Symposium, is around the corner. Don't forget to pick up your tickets and come see me present on the role of herbs acting as antimicrobials. I hope you enjoyed the show. Hello, everyone. Super excited to be here on the show with my friend, Alison Rogers. That was (laughs) perfect pronunciation. Alison Rogers. So we're drinking... Bootleg LaCroix, and we're talking strategy. (laughs) (laughs) So, Alison Vojtovich, in true 3030 health fashion, what is your hero story? How did you end up in this crazy health space? Dude, this health space is super crazy, first of all. I started out being the kid who, you know, I did gymnastics, volleyball, sports growing up, but didn't really, like, I ate a normal American diet. And then... Senior year of high school came around and I hadn't been doing sports any longer. I quit to do theater. I started realizing like getting insecure like many young women do. So I was like, hey, let's try and eat a little bit healthier. I had no idea what that meant. Just eat more vegetables, I guess. So um, somewhere along the way, I started counting everything I ate. I would freak out if I had more than like 1,200 calories a day. And if I didn't get to exercise, it would be the worst thing. Ended up coming home from my first semester of freshman year at UT. And my parents were like, hey, have you been eating? (laughs) And uh, I truly didn't know how obsessive I was. I just thought I was trying to be healthier and, you know, you need to be consistent, whatever. And... um, I had started this Instagram called Flabs to Fitness and I was didn't tell anyone I had it. I was just, you know, using it as inspiration for myself. And um, it was filled with a lot of like pseudo body negative, I guess you could say, images of, you know, people who were kind of skinny and uh, or bodybuilders who I thought were just perfect looking. And why don't I look like that? And it sort of reversed my second semester of freshman year of college, uh, my mom kind of was like, yo, you look kind of sick, like maybe eat a little bit more some days. And when you're in a constant state of calorie deficit, your body wants to react in the opposite way. You're super familiar with Rob Wolf's work. We were just talking about it before the show. So he talks about, you know, if you're starving, the body wants to make up for that. So the first time I intentionally ate a lot, I just totally binged and I didn't know that I needed it, needed or wanted it and it turned into a cycle. So I totally like gained back weight and then some. So by the end of freshman year, I was just kind of fucked. I was like, I don't know what's healthy, I whatever. And I read a lot that summer. I didn't want anyone to see me. I felt fat. I didn't want my friends from high school to see me. So I just worked and I read and I found it starts with food. Mm-hmm by Dallas and Melissa Hartwig. And when I first saw it on display, I was like, these assholes are promoting veganism. There's no way I'm going to buy this book. Like everyone just wants you to go vegan and my family hunts. So I was like, there's no way. (laughs) Before we go into the paleo rabbit hole. Yeah, it's a deep one. (laughs) Yeah, or uh, antler hole or whatever you hunt. What do you hunt? Oh my gosh. So most regularly we do dove. Dove hole. (laughs) Dove and deer. Okay, do you think you fell into the orthorexia or eating disorder spiral? Oh, yeah, for sure. I was so obsessive. I mean, it's hard to fight back from that, especially when when you have that orthorexia pattern. It's super easy kind of to stay in that. But when someone breaks it, like when I first decided to break it, 
it feels even worse because you still have that perfectionism in your head and you're still like, oh, no, 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 I can just go back to this. But your body has been given some extra energy and it's going to keep fighting back now. It wants that food. So it's this really odd internal struggle of I'm orthorexic and I want to be perfect at all these things. But then also my body is starving and fighting against every piece of what I'm thinking and making me binge and I don't want to. So for my listeners, what's orthorexia? Orthorexia, as defined by me, is an intense obsession with clean eating, whatever that might be. And it can, can involve um, working out as well. So you'll see some vegan orthorexics, you'll see some paleo people, you'll see some who just say clean eating, which for me for a long time actually meant as low fat as possible. So I would literally eat just plain spinach leaves because I knew that was like 15 calories or something and I would just eat spinach leaves and if I wanted some flavor I would wrap them in like I would wrap one around a grape and <laughs> eat it and I would count out my grapes and my friend caught me doing this one day and she's like what the fuck are you doing I said oh it's just a snack it's fine it's healthy and that's funny because it, because it's healthy quote unquote we think it's okay and we can rationalize this and, th and, and think to ourselves, oh, shit, you know, I'm eating healthy, so it's okay. As long as, as you know, we, we, I'm, at least I'm not eating fast food. We can rationalize things. Now, before we go into the paleo uh, rabbit hole, uh, what do you think about the backlash that we're, that we're experiencing now? I've been doing this paleo thing for a while. And when I started, it was a lot of like, oh, calories don't matter. Right. And then it, it, it was like macros. And then you can go as far back as zone 40, 30, 30. And then now a lot of the messages that we're receiving on the face space is, oh, nothing matters. Calories in, calories out. And, you know, it almost like if it fits your macros kind of mentality. How do you feel about that as, as a health expert in this space? Do you think that that's going to you know, bite us in the ass in, in, in the near future? I think any extremism bites anyone in the ass. But, but what I'm talking about is that the pendulum went to the extreme and now we're like back in the middle where people are like, nothing matters, you know, uh, you know, we're like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Where I, I think a lot of people, including me, became a little bit orthorexic. And now we're like the, the pendulum has swung and now we're again in the, well, it depends and nothing matters and you can eat shit and lose weight. And, yeah. and the science says that you can eat whatever. What do you think is the next step? I think the research on the actual effects of quality food needs to be stronger. So like I, I got my nutrition coaching certification through Precision Nutrition. And they don't openly say they support any one like movement. They don't say they're paleo. They don't say they're vegan, whatever. If you were to ask the founder, he tends to lean a little more paleo, I think. Just looking at their meal templates, they never suggest that you eat bread. They never suggest that you eat certain things that aren't paleo. But um, they also acknowledge that you're not going to convince everyone to cut out cheese. You're not going to convince everyone to not eat bread. So they work based on a huge amount of research that they've gathered, how do people tend to lose weight? And it is consistency and a certain way that you can portion your meals and they try to work with people and meet them where they're at. So when I coach someone, I try never to tell them don't eat this. I just try to tell them do eat that. And so I think right now the confusion too comes from, like I said, lack of research on the specific effects of things that aren't paleo or things that are more processed. We have all these theories of what sucralose is doing and red 40 and yellow five or whatever, but there's not a ton of research on them. There's some articles coming out, but no one's been able to say, okay, definitively, this is what yellow number five does to us. So I think it's a matter of time, first of all. And sometimes instead of like focusing on like, oh, what the fuck is glycophosphate? Uh, uh, glycophosphate. Glycophosphate doing to us. What what are the effects of red forty? Instead of like trying to see, you know, or like criminalize that, we should be worrying about eating real food, you know, and yeah. and because you can make a pretty tasty cookie without any additives and without and that's going to not be conducive to weight loss. Oh yeah, totally. So one thing I did want to say on the lack of research for additives, we see so many 
quote unquote fads coming out recently, the carnivore diet, yeah. keto, paleo is still considered a fad by a lot of people, vegan, fruititarian. They're all of these things. And you tend to see anyone who switches to any of those from a standard American diet tends to get healthier. Yeah. They tend to look better. And like you said, I think it is just a root of eat real food. Like I, I like to treat myself as an experiment. I will totally, I've totally done keto before just to see how it feels. Whole 30. Sure. I've even considered going carnivore for a month just to see what it's like and what it feels like. But at the end of the day, any of those options are overall better than the standard American diet. And that's why you see improvement from there. But I have also seen clients run into the issue where they're like, I'm eating everything paleo. Why am I not losing weight? Or why did I gain weight on paleo? And I say, well, you know, record what you're eating for a few days and we'll get back to it. Turns out they're eating half a pound of almonds as their snack in the <laughs> afternoon. Do you realize how much, how many calories that is? I know no one wants to like admit the calories in calories out thing, but it does but matter. It does matter. It does matter. So, like, so again, we're dovetailing again into this. Into you know, this it, median. In, into this. And I think that it frustrates a lot of people that after all these years, you know, because had you asked me 10 years ago, do calories matter? I would have been like, fuck no, they don't matter. It's all about the insulin. And, and, and now we know that, yeah, insulin plays a part and calories matter and food quality matters and everything matters. Food palatability, uh, macros, everything matters. I think you just kind of hit the human condition on the head with that one. We always want black and white answers, either or. It can't be nature and nurture. It has to be one or the other. No, it's always everything. So I've seen some people with totally fucked up hormones before who could literally not eat anything and they would still not lose weight. But, you know, at the same time, you see people who are totally overeating and they're thin as a rail. So there's definitely something to what's going on with these people genetically. Okay, how do we clear the air and give hope to people that are so confused? You know, and how can we reach out and say, hey, it's okay? I mean, I think we just need to start with that. If someone comes to me as a client and they're like, oh, I'm such a mess, like I'm so messed up, I, I can't do anything right, da, da, da. First of all, I say you are not your thoughts and you are not your opinions. Those are just things that happen in your head. Now. You can't do anything about what happened yesterday or two minutes ago or 10 years ago, but you can do something now. So let's start something now. And if you're not a cold turkey person, I'm totally a cold turkey person. Yeah. But if you're not someone who can just flip the switch, and most people can't, let's put in some actions into place where we will literally change your behavior. And it kind of frustrates people because we like our instant gratification, but there are certain building blocks that we can switch people to first and see where to go from there. The vast majority of the population is not being truthful with themselves about how they're actually eating. So they might say, oh, I'm eating paleo, but are you really? How much are you eating? How much are you exercising? Does it correlate? You need to check all of these things and make sure that the concrete of the foundation is in place and solid before you start building the house. You know, uh, when I was talking to Ben Lynch, uh, we were not recording and I said, you know, uh, I love having a podcast because I can bring experts and I can ask them stupid questions, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so I'm asking for my listeners, I'm asking all the stupid questions so you don't have to. <laughs> so when I talk to, to my patients, when I see them, you know, in, in their, um, in, in the consult room, you know, and, and we talk about one of the most personal things that we do which is eating, okay? And sometimes we're doing it twice, three times per day, even sometimes more. You're literally ingesting atoms, you know, and, and stripping electrons and incorporating them into your being. You yeah. know, what's more personal than that, you know? And you you have this decision that you can make in, in every day and you can do a good decision or a bad decision. And, and being able to be truthful with yourself and making sure that every time that you make this decision, it lands in the better, not the worst category, that's going to be the best for you. And one of the things too, I think that people forget is it sounds so intimate when you word it the way you just did of like, we are literally taking in something that we want to turn into ourselves. But at the same time, there are so many other pieces of eating and there are so many 
reasons for every person to turn off their emotion and their cognition when they're eating. It's kind of like we don't want to deal with our emotions, so we eat to distract ourselves most of the time. I heard someone describe it as I ate to suffocate the feelings. Hmm. Like I just, it felt like I could literally push the feelings down if I was swallowing food. I was like, I was swallowing my emotions. So the first thing that's always the hardest is I actually work on this with clients too. What do you feel like when you're hungry? What does physical hunger feel like? Because a lot of people don't remember. A lot of people wake up and they're like, oh, I have to eat breakfast. It's the most important meal of the day. And they'll eat and then they're bored on the way to work. So they snack and then they eat lunch because it's lunchtime. And then they snack in the afternoon because they don't have any energy or they're bored. And then they get home and they're like, oh, I'm going to sit in front of the TV and eat some more because it's dinner time. Oh, late night snack time. So no one's like people just put themselves on autopilot based on these schedules that we have and their boredom or their emotion. And they don't actually check in with their body at all. They ignore their body so much. So that's why I think we have this huge cognitive disconnect between what you eat literally becomes you. And for whatever reason, it's so hard for people to realize that the fuel we're ingesting becomes us because we just don't even think about our bodies as these things that are assimilating whatever goes into them or on them. You know, and to touch on that, you know, the, the feeling of hunger. And that's something that what was one of the most uh, enlightening things of switching to this style of eating because I didn't know what hunger was. I, I knew what being hypoglycemic or ha hangry. Yeah. I, I knew what that was. I knew yeah. it was like, oh shit, I'm about to die if mm -hmm. I don't eat something. And it was like clockwork around the same time. Uh, and now, if I'm flying, if I'm traveling, and uh, and I don't eat and I get hungry, mm -hmm. hung hunger is actually like motivating It feels great to be hungry. It's so funny to me that you said that because, like, I mean, I just flew in here to Phoenix today. I'm sitting in your apartment with you. This is not a <laughs> Skype podcast. Um, I flew in from, from Austin to Phoenix today, and I told you I woke up at 4 a.m. Austin time. I fasted until noon Phoenix time, which was 2 p.m. Austin time. And then I, I mean, again, it's nighttime now, and I haven't eaten again since, like, I had a snack maybe six hours ago, but it's, you're right. Like right now I'm hungry, but my stomach isn't making all these noises. I'm not like frantically searching for food. It's like, oh, I know I'm going to go to my friend's house after this and eat a bunch of good food. And, and like you, 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 you know, a couple of minutes ago, you said, oh, I'm going to go and eat a little salmon and it's exciting. It's so exciting. <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's motivating and, and evolutionarily it makes sense that hunger didn't just fuck you up and you had to curl down into a ball and wait for someone to feed you? No. Yeah, well, and you speak on the evolution, let's hit back on the hunting. Like, maybe that's why mental clarity comes It's, from fasting yeah. because, like, right now, I feel like I'm so focused on you and I'm, I love the fact that I can say, nope, I'll eat later. Because when I eat, I want to focus on the food. You know, that's how, that's a way you get in touch with your body and enjoy the experience of the food. So if I'm eating, I'm not doing anything else. But if I'm not eating, I get to go do other shit. So it's, it's like a fun thing, too, where it's a time trade-off. You know, days that I decide I'm not going to eat dinner tonight, I'll just get an extra, like, chapter or two in on my book or whatever. And it, it's great, but... Um, I don't remember which professional hunter it was, but one of them specifically doesn't bring any food with him and he just goes on these backpack hunts, which means like you're very likely to die on these backpack hunts. He goes, he doesn't tell anyone where he goes. He leaves his cell phone. He brings his bow and arrow and he brings a backpack with like a sleeping bag or something. And he just goes in the wilderness and whatever he finds or kills, that's what he eats. But he's talked about how the hunger motivates him. Like he said, And it makes his thinking so clear. And when he does finally get to sit down and eat whatever he harvested, it's just so much more rewarding. And we totally miss that when we go to the grocery store. We don't get that today. And how do you train someone to go from being hangry to controlling their emotions? Because, you know, we are the weird ones that can go a day without eating. Yeah. In reality, the majority of people carry some amount of calories. So how long did it take you 
to go from the six times a day because you know your metabolism is going to you know go to sleep and, and crash and you're gonna die you're losing muscle how long did it take you as a female you know because that's another thing that people say oh well you're a guy so you, you know yeah. how long did it take you for, for you to be able to go from hangry to hunger i think probably six months into strict paleo i finally had learned how to listen to my body again because coming from disordered eating habits you literally it is the opposite of listening to your body you think the standard american public isn't listening to their body no like disordered eaters they know exactly what their body wants and then they ignore it so i literally felt like i had turned off the ability to listen to my body for a really long time so doing something like the whole 30 totally shifted my perspective because it made me think about, am I hungry right now? Okay, cool. I'm going to eat this meal. That was the first thing I had to relearn how to feel the hunger. Like I had mentioned before, after my first whole 30, I kind of just stuck to what I call strict paleo. So I didn't eat any grains, legumes, or dairy added a little bit of like maple syrup and things like that back in, but that was about it. I would say about six months in, I had kind of regained my love for food. I was loving learning how to make like favorite recipes that I had, you yeah. know, I was paleo-fying, paleo-fying. Yeah. Yep, paleo-fying things and then also just creating new stuff. And that's how people get in trouble. Yeah, and that's how people get in trouble to an extent. I was very lucky that I wasn't trying to make cookies all the time. Yeah. I was trying to make like chicken pot pie. You know, like I, I really wanted savory stuff, um, which is odd because I have a huge sweet tooth. Oh, okay, cool. But okay. yeah, so, you know, for that first six months or so, I felt really good about it. And I think after that, I realized like, oh, I'm not getting hangry anymore. I very distinctly remember going to like football games at UT and coming home after the game, realizing I hadn't eaten since breakfast and being like, oh, I skipped lunch. Well, I, I guess I'll eat dinner now. And, you know, so it wasn't like... And you're obviously fatigued after that. It's hot outside. You're wearing cowboy boots, whatever. So I like knew I needed to eat and I was hungry, but it wasn't hangry. You know, and, it was and, definitely a switch. And it's not, it's not like you have to overeat. Yeah. You, you can just eat a normal meal and you'll be completely satisfied. Well, like think about it. How many people do you know binge on broccoli? Yeah. <laughs> like it's, that doesn't happen. You don't yeah. binge on chicken breast. You know, you eat until you're satisfied and then you're good. So if you're focusing on eating those whole foods, like you said, it it helps. And I think uh, the nutrient density really helps with it too. Like, I think it's part of the reason why it's so easy, other than the fact that they're designed to be easy to overeat. Processed foods, they're so nutrient deficient, the body registers nutrients more than calories. So that's why it's so easy to eat 10,000 calories of sugar and still feel hungry because your body's not listening to the the energy provided by the carbohydrate in the sugar. It's paying attention to, okay, did I get enough vitamin A? Where's my B12 at? You know, it's looking for all those like essential daily vitamins and minerals that you're supposed to be getting from your food. So if you're eating a whole foods based diet, you're getting an abundance of those. The funny thing is that we wish that it would apply to okay, I can eat, you know, tablespoons of sugar and a multivitamin, but it really doesn't work like that either. I mean, there's got to be something to the fiber and the protein and the fat and all of it. Or, or the physiological assimilation of the food, you know, like there has to be something more than that, you know. So it depends. <laughs> we go back to it doesn't matter. We talk about too sometimes like the bioavailability of vitamins, like from whole foods, you tend to take up more of those than if you were to take just a multivitamin and some multivitamins have contradictory vitamins and minerals in them (laughs) like you know block each other's absorption i I, I was talking to uh to luis villasenor about about this very subject about how protein matters okay Mm -hmm. and if you want to build muscle you don't want to have one or two boluses of protein Mm -hmm. you actually want to have you know four servings of leucine not because you know like if you want to if you want to maximize the machinery to build muscle you're better off eating three times in a restricted window than eating the bolus of leucine the calories will prevent you from uh, from losing muscle mass and you know it, it, like if you take one big you know so the but the perfect scenario would be to take three different um meals because you, you are physiologically handicapped at how much leucine you can convert into muscle 
But that doesn't, you know, that now that's just like you know splitting hairs. In yeah. the end, you know, it, it, you know, if you're a bodybuilder and your your job is to grow muscle, yeah. that's when you start looking at into things like that. Right. So I imagine that when you take a multivitamin or or you drink something like Soylent, you're you're, you're taking don't drink Soylent. <laughs> you're taking a super physiological amount of the of the vitamins, and you're not gonna assimilate them. You know, it's like the case of curcumin. Curcumin, the best way of taking curcumin is a little bit every day. If you take a bunch, you're just going to poop it out. Because physiologically, we can only absorb a little bit. And, and all these companies have, oh, I have this liposomal version. that is gonna... No. Just... <laughs> the body still can, has to work at its own pace. <laughs> yeah. You, and that's exactly my point. The body has to work at its own pace. Now, uh, you talked about having a sweet tooth. Oh, Yeah. How did you break that? Because that's a question. Oh. You know, it's, it's like I apologize to all my listeners. <laughs> you know, I, uh, all the time I tell I tell my patients, yeah, just stop eating sugar. And they're like, how? And I don't know. I don't have a sweet tooth. Oh, <laughs> I don't miss God. it. <laughs> just don't have a sweet tooth. Then it's yeah, fine. that's it. Um, so. Uh, do, do you have any, like, like, any, like, specific hacks? So, No. It's so it just went it's away. so crazy. Well, I told you I'm a cold turkey person. Ah. So I think when I switched to paleo, I went straight from counting my macros and just kind of eating whatever. I very specifically remember posting a picture of frozen yogurt one time <laughs> and someone on my Instagram commented and was like, high fructose corn syrup. Oh my <laughs> God. And I was like, I literally responded to them. I was like, shut the fuck up. I don't care. It fits my macros. Yeah. <laughs> and then I found that picture the other day and I laughed. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't want to eat that high fructose corn syrup. Um, but when I, I did Whole30, like, it forced me to cut all the sugar out, right? So I think a hard reset was definitely part of it for me. And I also knew myself. So coming from the, the background of orthorexia to binge eating, and I binged on some weird shit. I literally would buy granola and eat bags of granola. <laughs> like, it wasn't like, even, like, weirdest, good things. It wasn't even good things. It was just, like, random stuff. I don't, like know if I had a secret weapon other than I literally did just cut it out cold turkey for 30 days and the first couple weeks of the whole 30 suck no matter who you are but I also knew when that program was over that you could have it back I could have it back but I didn't want it Mm -hmm. the reason whole 30 was appealing to me coming from a calorie counting orthorexic background was because it gave me rules to follow still I truly didn't trust myself to not have some sort of rules. So when I found Whole30 and it totally was against everything I'd been told, it was like, don't count your macros. You're not allowed to weigh yourself. No body measurements for 30 days. You can do it before and after, but that's it. I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I need. Because I've been so obsessed with how I look and how I weigh for so long. I need to step away and just actually like try and figure out how to eat without counting my macros for the rest of my life. Because I truly thought I was going to just be counting my macros forever. And so uh, when I did that, it totally just kind of reset things. And when the whole 30 ended, I think the first thing I missed was peanut butter. So I was like, I'm going to try it. And I tried it and it made me so bloated. My gut must have been wrecked after all the crap that I had put through it. And so I kind of tried a couple things like that. I tried peanut butter. I think I maybe tried some cheese. And I just decided, like, I'm not going to eat anything not paleo for a while and see what happens. So I did start to get a little bit of a sweet tooth again. I was like, oh, I'd like some pancakes or something. But I, you know, stuck to paleo ingredients. But my kryptonite is ice cream. (laughs) And I honestly think the reason I didn't start eating paleo ice cream was because not much of it existed when I was, you know. And and that's a problem too. Not much of it existed like commercially. And I also didn't have an ice cream maker. (laughs) So (laughs) So I couldn't make my own. (laughs) So those things kind of help. So I guess as general advice to someone trying to cut it, set up your environment so that you succeed. Uh, I mentioned Precision Nutrition earlier. The guy that founded it, Dr. John Berardi, he talks about, he's got like Berardi's first rule and it's, if it's in the house, it will be eaten. doesn't matter when, it just will be eaten. And I can attest to that every single time. Like, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's something that I like and I buy it and I put it in the house, and I, it's going to get eaten. So I think setting up your environment for success is the number one thing. And then um, surrounding that is once you clear out all the crap that you don't want to be eating, you need to supply yourself with the good stuff. 
because it's too easy to just call in something that you don't want to eat or go to the restaurant that you know you shouldn't be at and order that thing. So w what are some things that you've brought back that are going to make paleo people you know, <laughs> blush? Yeah. Um, so I, did, I, I was strict paleo for about a year straight. And then my friend Anne over at um, Grass-Fed Salsa, she's a nutrition coach. And uh, Grass-Fed grass salsa. Fed salsa, isn't that great? <laughs> um, so she has this program called Ditch Your Nutritionist. And it's like a three-week thing where it's pretty similar to Whole30, but you also cut out eggs. Afterwards, she gives you a game plan to reintroduce everything and find what your actual sensitivities are. So I did it. And I had been paleo for, yeah, about a year when I tried this with her. And I was still kind of getting some chin acne. And I knew at this point that it was like food that was doing it to me. But I was like, I don't know what it is. So I did her thing. And I was praying that it wasn't eggs <laughs> because I love eggs so much. And it was totally eggs. Nah. <laughs> like, but she gave me this protocol on how to reintroduce things so that I would reintroduce one new thing every three days. And if I started noticing a reaction from it, I knew what the thing was because I was only reintroducing the one thing. So um, we did it with cheese. Nothing bothered me. Uh, if anything, my acne actually cleared up a little bit. Um, I think it has something to do with the leucine in it, but that's just my theory. And then the eggs, of course, made my chin break out. And I didn't even want to try to reintroduce gluten and soy. So yeah. basically now I've tried everything and I know certain legumes, so certain beans, like kidney beans will make me bloat still, but lentils are fine. So... Rice uh, is usually fine. White rice is fine. Um, I work out a lot so I can handle the carbs, but it's just like I've just reintroduced things. And for me now, like my non-negotiables are gluten and soy. Like, and I've had accidental like reintroductions of them and I've been okay. Sometimes I can notice and sometimes I don't. So that is just a testament to me that my gut is really healed now. Um, I'll supplement with whey protein pretty regularly. Uh, so that's dairy. I'll eat yogurt sometimes. I haven't had whey protein in a while. Yeah. I wonder what would happen if I took whey. A lot of people who aren't even, like, who don't even notice, like, a reaction from regular dairy still notice a reaction to whey protein sometimes. You know, it's funny because when people come into my office, okay, with, like, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, mm -hmm. which is an autoimmune disease of your thyroid, off the bat, without having to test them, I take them off of wheat, dairy, and eggs. And this is because whenever we test people, those are the things that they come back with. On the on the flip, eggs are probably one of the first things that I bring back it, it, because they're so healthy. And most of the sensitivities come from, you know, intestinal permeability. Right. So if you, if you remove the wheat and you happen to be one of the lucky ones that can produce lactase, mm -hmm. you know, then... Most of the time, some dairy can come back, but wheat is, you know, it, it's just so inflammatory. So the thing about dairy is that you can be allergic to so many things and so many fractions of the dairy. Right. So lactose is a sugar. People that can't produce lactase, which is the enzyme that breaks down the sugar, your gut bacteria ends up consuming that sugar and, and, and farting the and, the then, fart, and, yeah. and, and then you get osmosis and then you have diarrhea. But it also has whey, which is a protein. It and can casein. be and, and and albumin. So you have three different proteins that can be pretty inflammatory and the sugar. So it makes total sense that a lot of people are uh, would have a sensitivity to dairy. And because you are eating all these inflammatory things, poor eggs, you yeah. know, they they cross react through right. molecular mimicry. Have you noticed have you have you tested this at all with your clients? Um between the yolk and the egg white, a difference. So intuitively, I know that the egg yolk is going to be way better than, than the white because I have it in, you know, the, that very nasty protein within the egg white. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, uh, we've developed protocols to heal the gut yeah. and to minimize IgG reactions within the gut. Mm -hmm. And pretty much most of my patients are able to start eating eggs again. That's awesome. You know, dairy, uh, I, I like cheese, uh, yep. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I don't try to reintroduce it because when you start eating cheese, now you start eating, you know, now the possibilities are endless. Yeah. Cheeseburgers and pizza come to mind, yeah. you know, uh, even if it's a gluten-free bun, it's probably not the best for you. Even if it's a gluten-free crust, it's probably not the best for you. Only on special occasions, blah, blah, blah. Right. 
but eggs are so good for you. Yeah. So that's why I like I try to get eggs back, but cheese and the and, and gluten, yeah, fuck gluten. <laughs> I was like, I'm not, I'm not even gonna try. I used to joke that I would make I should uh, bodybuilders would cry if they ever saw me prepare my eggs for a while because we realized that it was just the whites that were causing me to break out. So I would separate the yolk from the the white yeah. and toss the white and eat the yolk. <laughs> and it was like I'm wasting so much free protein, protein. for these bodybuilders. Yeah. Right now. But yeah, I mean now I think I'm finally to a point where I can have them. The egg whites when they're raw, mm -hmm. that's when they start binding to things. Right. But have you like tried like hard fried eggs? Yeah, I actually think I respond better to the raw ones. Really? Well, I got I got a I pro know. tip for you. Go to Costco and buy pasteurized egg whites, and and, and, see. and just drink it. Drink it. <laughs> That's true bodybuilder fashion yeah. right there. I'll eat a raw egg. That grosses a lot of people out. I've totally eaten raw eggs they, before. It, just crack it in my mouth and eat it. For people listening, Guillermo made a slightly scared face when I said that. <laughs> He's like, "Oh God, who am I sitting across from right now?" <laughs> But it, it's so fascinating, you know. And and then. So we've been talking about food and, yeah. and, and how great we are because we're great. <laughs> you know, we're so smart. Uh, but and another aspect, and, and I know as a, as a trainer, you see this a lot with your clients, is that sometimes people come in and they're doing everything right yeah. and they still can't lose weight. The, a conversation that I've had in the past couple of weeks with a couple of my patients is that, you know, If your hormones are wrong, if you if your hormones are not ticking properly, you know, and then you're the way that you're working out is by going to the gym and running in the treadmill mm -hmm. and seeing, oh, that says 900 calories. I burned 900. I have an extra 900 calories. Right. Well, that's if Michael Phelps was running on the treadmill. That's if <laughs> Usain Bolt, you know, yeah. us mere humans are probably burning 300 calories right. and we're making up by a lot. That was so. Someone tried to tell me the other day that humans aren't meant to run endurance because X, Y, Z. And while I hate endurance sports personally, I don't think the reason people gain weight on endurance sports is because we're fucking up our hormones or we're not meant to do them primarily. I think it's because what you said. We'll go and run three miles and be like, oh my gosh, I'm so hungry. And then we'll eat a thousand calories. But three mile run burns about 300 calories. You, do you know how many 5Ks I ran where at the end of the 5K, there was like beer gardens? Well, that's, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every single 5K. Yeah. And then like you see people who are training for marathons and they gain weight. And, and like, you know, people start training for these things because they're trying to get in shape and lose weight. And they end up heavier than when they started with more and fat. With, and with bad knees. If, yeah. If they were, if they were heavier when they, than when they started because of muscle gain, that's one thing. But it's always because they've gained fat. Or most of the time. And I think it's because you overestimate how much you've burned. The hunger and the, the afterburn feels so strong, but you really only burned a couple hundred calories if you went three miles or And whatever. even if you're counting calories, you know, if you go and pop into a calorie, uh, in, into a macro calculator, mm -hmm. and, and everything is estimated through your BMR, but if your hormones are fucked, Then, then you're like overestimating. And I think people get scared too because they think there's nothing they can do about their hormones themselves. Correct. The number one thing you can do is sleep. Go to sleep. If you have to choose between sleeping four hours so that you can get up at five and do your run before work or sleeping seven hours, sleep seven hours. Do your workout at some other time. Do a shorter workout. Do something that isn't going to stress you out as much. Prioritize the sleep first. And then go deal with the fitness. It's you, health before fitness. You, you've just described my worst patient. You know, that's my, every patient. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not. You know, because if if I, if I was to draw a line and have two different types of patients, I have the patient that does not work out. They intuitively know that they need to work out because working out is healthy. Right. But they just have fatigue and, and, you know, I got to build them up, you know, maybe fix their fucking hormones and, you know, in order for them to be able to run or exercise or lift weights. And then I have on the other side, the patient who is type A. And they do everything. Everything. And they got to wake up at four and, they, and, and they, they'll say things like, but that's the way I de-stress. And intuitively, because they know that working out is good for them, they think that more is more when they're just 
chipping away at their health. Yeah. And it is so difficult for me to switch that switch and, yeah. and, and convince them that, holy shit, dude, you need to sleep. You need to relax. You need to, you know, spend time with your wife. You know, <laughs> why are you waking up at four in the morning so you can, you know, punish yourself? I'm totally a type A person, if you can't tell. I'm very type A. And I do. I'll do the wake up at five thing. I get up. I go. I like to walk on the treadmill, like very slow pace. I totally copy Ben Greenfield on this. I walk at a slow pace with my computer on the treadmill and I answer my emails in the morning. It wakes me up. It's great. But I'm also an actor. I'm also a stand up comedian. If I am out late at the club or at a show, I'm not waking up at five the next day. I make sure I get at least seven hours of sleep. And last week totally threw me on my ass. Shit, last man. week was paleo, like the week after Paleo yeah. FX. And I was so excited. I was like, oh, after the event, I'm going to you know rest for a day. And then I get to go to the gym again before I go on this trip for three weeks. Totally went to the gym twice, half-assed this workout. And halfway through both of those workouts, I was like, I shouldn't be doing this right now. Went home, went for a walk outside, went to bed early, got nine or ten hours of sleep. Yeah. And by, so today's Tuesday, yesterday was Monday. I finally got like my first good workout in after the conference because I spent the whole prior week recovering and sleeping and just doing slow stuff, like going for a walk outside and enjoying the sunlight. Paleofix kicked my ass. Oh my gosh. I had no idea it was going to knock me on my butt like that. I talk about like intermittent fasting a lot and I've been doing it for so long and I feel great whenever I intermittent fast. Like sometimes, you know, like every once in a while, I'll go have brunch. Right. And that's like a big deal because I don't usually eat it, anything for breakfast. Yeah. Yesterday, I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the first time in probably years because I felt so depleted. That, I also noticed that. I was getting so mad at myself last week for feeling like I needed to eat more than normal. Yeah. I was like, I'm not exercising. I don't need this much food. But my body just wanted it. And I actually woke up feeling leaner. I just needed the calories yeah. because I was just so fucked up mm -hmm. because, you know, it's like being, so let's talk about paleo effects. Oh, so gosh. what's your involvement with paleo effects? So my title with paleo effects is social PR coordinator. How do you get involved with it? So I graduated from UT in May of 2017 with a bachelor of arts in acting and a bachelor of science in kinesiology. I was friends with Keith Norris. I literally think we met on Instagram. <laughs> I legit think that's what happened. I had gotten coffees, coffee with him a few times. He'd trained me before. Great guy, Keith. Love Keith. Hi, Keith. He knew I was graduating. I graduated the weekend of Paleo FX 2017. So I literally showed up to the event, said hi to all my vendor friends, went and walked, and then came the next day to see the talks and say hi to everyone again. And you got a really cool shirt. Yeah, I got your, your shirt. <laughs> How the hell did you know? Literally, <laughs> you handed it to my friend Zach, and my friend Zach handed it to me. He's like, I don't know what this is, but it's a free shirt. Here you go. <laughs> and I've had that. I wear that shirt all the time, and I brought it on this trip, actually, and I was going to wear it for you today, but I just, <laughs> I didn't but, have the time to But you're change. sweaty, so I don't I'm want so you sweaty. putting sweat on my brand. <laughs> I'll, like, fly it over the cliffs of Moore in Ireland. Yes! <laughs> um, so I got coffee with Keith right after I graduated, and he's like, dude, what are you doing? And I was like... I don't know. I started this company and I don't freaking know like how to market what I'm doing, whatever. And he goes, you need to talk to my team. So he put me in contact with the people running Paleo FX's marketing. And they were like, yeah, you don't know what you're doing on the marketing <laughs> front. Um, let's get you an internship. So they convinced Paleo FX to take me on as their fall intern. So from August through December of 2017, I was the Paleo FX intern. And literally the week that I joined as the intern, their content coordinator left and their Instagram person was on the way out. So I got to kind of fill a bunch of holes for a little while. Um, I learned everything from content, like optimization for SEO to all of their publishing strategy strategies for social media, which social media is my jam. I already knew that. So I actually improved theirs for them. All of these things that they just kind of needed someone to help out with. And throughout that semester, I say semester, I wasn't in school, but it was a semester. Um, the marketing team kind of got rebuilt. Um, so by the time January rolled around, they were like, hey, we have this PR position kind of in the works. They were like, we think you should stay on. And so I was like, 
okay, what's this going to look like? And they said, let's just build it. So <laughs> January, I came on as an employee, uh, just part time, but, um, I took over content creation for them. So I do all of the, um, social media content every month. Uh, I run affiliate partnerships, which means other companies that we maybe promote their products. Um, I manage those as well as our affiliates. So people who sell tickets with us, um, and get a commission off of it. I book Keith and Michelle on podcasts, on Facebook lives. I get Thank pe- you for that. You're welcome. I get people on our channel for Facebook lives. I'm still trying to convince Keith and Michelle to start a podcast. And I also reached out to media. So like reporters, other podcasters, things like that to get them to come to the event and cover it. And yeah, so that sounds like a long laundry list. Now my position, I think, is going to focus more on the content stuff. I, I'm, I'm a naturopath and I had to like, you know, kind of build an audience and build a list. And what are some tips that you would tell people that are trying to break into this health scene that don't know how to um, how to start and, you know, building content and how to uh, how to reach out and and start their social media? You know, where do you start with that? For me, I love Instagram. That's where I started. I always joke that my my uh, Instagram started my company. Hmm. And it's actually interesting. You'll find a lot of small companies saying that. I'm like, oh, we started on Instagram because we like this thing. And oh, now we have a company. Oops. So I would say start with what you like. You know, I, I said I started on Instagram. I've seen plenty of people start through Facebook. Um, you and I were talking about Facebook Lives a little bit earlier and how like Those are really cool, you know, a cool platform to use. I've seen people use their personal page and just go live on there and they get followings on their personal page. It's not even a page that you go and like. It's just me, Alison Wojtovich as a person. Someone clicks follow on me and then they get notifications when I go live. You know, that that is so funny because I have a personal page and a business page. Mm -hmm. My business page sucks. My business page has performed so terribly because of the algorithm now. Yeah, my, my personal page lit. Yeah, yeah, it's so much better. And so a lot of people are doing that. Keto Gains guys totally went through Reddit. Reddit, I hate Reddit. I absolutely (laughs) hate Reddit. Luis, I give you all the credit in the world because I hate that platform, but there's so many people on it. And it's so underutilized as a marketing platform. But if you know how to use it and you know how to moderate a good channel like they do, like you they're like most of their people came from Reddit. On that point, you gotta have a good product. Because you can have you can have the best mods and you can have the best you know uh, pictures, right. but if you don't have a good product, you're gonna fizzle out. May, that might be true on Reddit. I disagree on some other channels though, <laughs> because like so. Okay, so I'm so, starting my Instagram because my product is shit. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> you promised me. <laughs> no, so I, I mentioned the Mind Pump Media guys earlier today. They literally just started a podcast because they wanted to talk about whatever they wanted to talk about they started providing such good, just pure content on something that they cared about that when they finally did have a product that they launched, their people just all wanted to buy it. They trusted these guys. So it's, I don't think you need to start with a product. I didn't start with a product. I started posting pictures of my food because I wanted to keep track of what I was eating. And people started following me. I guess when I said product, I said, I, I meant content. Content. Okay. Yeah, your, your content so, has to be good. Yes. So, yeah, I would de- definitely make a distinction between product as in something you want to sell as a company or as a sole proprietor versus content, which is just the information you're putting out in the world. You can post selfies all day <laughs> and get lots of followers, yep. but you can't really turn a business in, out of that. Um so, yeah, if you're if you're just trying to provide good information and knowledge and e- images or articles or podcasts or whatever it is, just make it good and and then you'll be providing value to someone. And that's how people find you and that's how you make connections. So, what's your company? <laughs> My company is called Flabs to Fitness. And it started out with me thinking I was being really clever with a play on words like rags to riches. Uh, I officially incorporated my little food blog website in April 2017, a month before I graduated from UT. I was and still am a certified personal trainer as well as nutrition coach. And I just wanted to be able to provide online health coaching to people from wherever. I love to travel. I love to act. uh, So I wanted to be able to help people and coach them on a platform that allowed for time flexibility and location flexibility. Because if I were to audition for something and get cast in another state, I want to be able to move and not lose my entire clientele. So that's how it started. 
And then along the way, I was started working with MSW Lounge, which is a clinic in Austin, Texas that does vitamin shots, IVs, chiropractic, blood work, things like that. And I was going to come on as the nutrition coach of the facility. And they said, we kind of like what you're doing with the social media stuff. We don't know how to do it. Can you do this for us? So I was like, yeah. So started running their social media. They launched a national brand called Slenderella, which is a liver detox vitamin blend that you can put in IVs or shots. They were like, we need you to do this social media too. And I said, cool, got it. And then they said, we want a podcast. And I was like, well, I don't fucking know how to do a podcast. So <laughs> It's I, very easy. You just buy a microphone. So easy. You buy a microphone. <laughs> but I didn't understand how RSS feeds work. I literally had to start from the ground up. So I like researched you know, all this it, shit. It's so funny, you know, and, because like <laughs> I have a fucking podcast. Anyone can have a fucking podcast. And then when some, when my friends ask me, I want to have a podcast just like yours. And I go, A, no. It's the market <laughs> Don't is. Don't copy it. No, yeah. the market is saturated. <laughs> Everyone and their mother has a fucking podcast. Yeah. But I will help you. Yeah. And, and I give them, you know, my resources and I tell them what I do. And I go, Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> and but you know it. what? <laughs> Once you, want, you put something in your head, you'll do it. And, yeah. and, and you know, but. <sighs> but all that being said, I took the marketing internship at the same time that I was starting to kind of pick up this stuff that I didn't even realize was marketing for <laughs> MSW lounge and Slenderella. And, um, so it turned into, they started contracting my company as their brand manager as what they call it. So basically I produce all of their social content, their podcast. I coordinate them on other podcasts as well as getting our guests on uh, their blog, I edit all of the stuff on the blog and make it pretty, make it SEO compatible and things like that. So while I was learning all these things with Paleo FX, I started applying it to MSW that's Lounge. So, that's so awesome. And, that, and, that's, and you know, it's great cross-pollination. And the two companies love each other now. MSW Lounge was at Paleo FX. They were a huge hit. Keith and Michelle come see us at the lounge. It's great. It's really cool cross, cross-pollination. And, and, and that's like the intersection of opportunity and, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, preparation. You know, you, you took advantage of the opportunities that Keith and Michelle gave you. And that's amazing. Those two guys, I love them. They're so wonderful. And it's, it's a good message for paying it forward because I'm still very young. I'm still learning all my shit. And I was talking to you about this before the show. But now that my company has these two completely different sources of income, I have my coaching clients and then I have my marketing clients. I am splitting the company, you know, on, on the books at least um, so that I can have kind of a, a content marketing firm. And my hope with that is to build up a team of people who like to create good content for health brands. And I think that's a really cool foot in the door to have in the health industry where I do have, I do know the science. I do have the degree. I do have the certifications and I do have clients and I've gone through the shit myself. I still train regularly, all that, whatever meal prep every week. And you you have your fingers on the pulse of the movement, uh, you yeah. know, working with I'm people involved like in the G- movement Greenfield, myself. Mark Sisson, Rob Wolf, Guillermo Ruiz. Guillermo Ruiz. You know, yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, I'm in it as a coach and therefore I know what the content Correct. has. And that's the cool thing too with John. Like he is so smart. Uh, John is the owner of MSW Lounge, Jonathan Mendoza. He'll, he'll hand me a blog post and it's just a stream of consciousness <laughs> thing. He'll be like, this is the topic I'm writing on. He'll be like, why methylcobalamin B12 is good. And then he'll just go and like write me three pages of this thing. And I have to go and dissect John's thoughts. And this is a guy who has his DC, he's a chiropractor and he's a FMP. He's got his nurse practitioner degree. So smart. But like the fact that I have the experience that I have and the accreditations that I have, I'm able to, you know, make the content in that space good because I understand what's behind it. So I think it's a cool angle to take at the marketing point. I want to help the health movement grow. And that's why we're here to help people. And in the end, you know, uh, it, it, this is all about trying to expand this paleo ancestral health movement to impact the world and try to help as many people as we can. And I think circling back on your question of where do I start? Like, how do you, how do you get your foot in the door? Start with the platform you like the most, pick that one, be consistent on it and get good at it. Yeah. I mean, 
you know, if you don't care what platform you go on, I'd say try to go for like YouTube or something because <laughs> you can make some good money if you can figure out yeah. that damn algorithm. That's where I'm stuck right now. I love making video content and I can make it fairly well, but I just, you know, but that's a, again, it's a learning curve. I like to do it. So I'm now finally starting to get consistent on YouTube to just see what happens. You know but, who Amber Spears is? Yes. I asked her, what's the next platform? You know, because Josh Axe has that YouTube oh, thing, yeah. you know. Uh, um, Alison Vojtovich has Instagram. <laughs> Hulk. You you and Emily Schramm. Uh, uh, Emily Schramm has it a <laughs> lot better than I do. Speaking uh, of which, I still didn't get to meet her paleo <laughs> effects. I'm so mad about I, you this. You know, I'll, I'll, next time I talk to Emily, I'm going to be like, Emily. <laughs> she's probably going to be like, oh my God, no, she's a crazy fan girl. I'm not, Emily. I just think you're great. I just wanted to tell you she, you're doing awesome. She's crazy, awesome. Emily. Don't listen to her. I have crazy eyes right now. I'm foaming at the mouth. <laughs> Um, you know what? You no, know what? Uh, I just, Amber said. Amber Spears. She said that the next platform is what? Good copy. I haven't even heard of that. Being able to write a good email. Being oh, able. Good. To, oh, good. I thought yeah. you meant like this is like a social oh, okay. media. <laughs> good <laughs> copy. Like, she what she launched. She launched for her phone and started looking <laughs> at the did. app store. <laughs> uh, just no. having good content again. You know, yeah. having good content. No, there's that's that's it. That's the already, next. That's the next barrier. You there's know? already people who are literally their only job is to write email copy. Correct. Correct. Yeah, I mean that's the thing, and there's definitely an art to how do we get people to click on this thing more. Yeah, yeah, and and that's and that's it. You know, because the gap is getting bigger and bigger and bigger between yeah. the new people and and the citizens and the the Dr. Christiansons and the uh, Josh shacks and the pro mutters and the, and i can keep naming names and these people have millions of views a day oh yeah you know and then you have someone that gets excited because they got 20 views in a day well talking about one little helpful tool that you can use for email copies your subject line matters now um co-schedule is a social media scheduler platform but they have uh, an email subject line score system. Mm. So if you just Google like co-schedule email subject line score or whatever, it should pop up. But you can type in, you know, what what you want your email subject line to be and it'll yeah. score it on a, on a scale of 1 to 100 and tell you like reasons why it gave that score and give you tips on how to improve it. So you can just literally keep editing your, awesome. your email subject until you get it to whatever score you want. Well, Allison, you know, th this has been an amazing talk, you know, <laughs> and, uh, we've been talking for like, what, an hour and three minutes. My friend is texting me like, and asking if you? I'm okay. <laughs> she literally was like, I just got a really real weird feeling. Are you sure you're okay? You should send her a picture. <laughs> okay. So, uh. Where can people, you know, I know a lot of people are graduating uh, and they're going to start their practices and uh, and they might need someone to help them, you know, with social media. Yeah. I, I know people are very interested in the subject of, uh, of health and losing weight. And, you know, where can they reach you out for uh, if they want some personal coaching? Do you have any any uh, any uh, programs that, that you that you're promoting? Yeah. So I. Um my five by 10 and 20 workout program is the 20 minute workout you can do anywhere. Cool. So I started that kind of, um, it's a conglomeration of my history. I, I've worked in a training facility, um, for people with like mobility issues before. So, um, anything from knee injuries to shoulder to whatever. So I try to program this, this workout program for knee injuries, for pregnancy, things that, you know, easily adjustable. Um, but that's my subscription workout program. If you want an idea of how I train, it's a really cool place to start. It's only $19 a month and you get three workouts a week. Cool. You what know, about for like social media help and, you know, social media help, you can email flaps to fitness at gmail.com. My website is, um, www.flaps to fitness.com. That's F L A B S T O fitness.com. Um, at flaps to fitness on all social media, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram. Do you YouTube. have musically? I don't have musically. <laughs> oh my gosh. Don't get me on any more social media. I don't need it. <laughs> I literally, I open, I manage so many social media accounts. I'll open my Instagram and show people and it freaks them out. So, um, but yeah, flaps to fitness, the company, is uh we're getting an intern this summer awesome, awesome. so hopefully that you know, means the team will be growing you know paying for it 
yeah so you know, so awesome to have you on the show i'm uh, now you have to go uh hang out with your actual friends <laughs> your <laughs> you mother, have, i'm your... about to make guillermo drive me like 45 <laughs> minutes to this friend's house not your paleo friends uh, she's not paleo but they've cooked salmon supposedly <laughs> so i'm just gonna eat all of the salmon that they've left yeah, for you me you eat all of the salmon <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being on the show. I can't wait to, you know, to see where uh, this crazy health space is going to take us because I, I can see that we're going to be collaborating in the future. Oh, for sure. This awesome. is great. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs>